Hello, welcome to our Facebook Live question and answer session. I am Dr. Sarah Hallberg, and I am one of the medical directors here at Verda Health, and I'm also the primary investigator of our large clinical trial, looking at a remote supported continuous care intervention utilizing nutritional ketosis as a treatment for type 2 diabetes and prediabetes. And I am thrilled to be here with Dr. Katherine Metzger. Thanks, Dr. Halberg. Um, as Dr. Halberg said, I'm Katherine Metzger, and I'm a member of our clinical team here at Verda. And I work directly with patients um, during their time in the Verda treatment. So please list your questions today um, in the comments below the video, and we'll try to get to as many as we can in the next hour. It's really important, too, to note that this is not intended to be individual medical advice. The thoughts that we share today do not replace any advice from your primary care or specialty physicians. So our first question to get started, how does ketosis and Virtus treatment affect heart health and cardiovascular risk? Well, Catherine, that is a really great question and one we get all the time. And the exciting news that I have to share is we recently published a paper on this exact topic. So our paper looking at our one-year results on, and cardiovascular outcomes, again, was recently published, and I encourage everyone to follow the link and read it for themselves. But let's talk about some of the really important highlights in the trial. So, Catherine, of all the risk factors that we looked at, and there were 26 altogether, the Verda treatment improved 22 wow. of those. So, I mean, from a big overview standpoint, that's pretty remarkable. But now let's look a little bit more at some of the granular details here about things that patients are asking about. So one of the really important things is that patients who have insulin resistance, prediabetes, or type 2 diabetes very often struggle with something called atherogenic dyslipidemia. And let's pause for a minute and break that question down, or break that term down. Atherogenic dyslipidemia means essentially atherosclerosis causing cholesterol. And so what is this atherogenic dyslipidemia? What it is, it, it is increased triglyceride levels, decreased HDL or good cholesterol, and LDL particles that are very small and dense. This is really the hallmark of atherogenic dyslipidemia. And once again, important to stress how very common it is in the insulin resistant patient population. So what happened with atherogenic dyslipidemia in our trial? Catherine, the results were really remarkable. Triglycerides decreased by almost 25%. HDL or good cholesterol went up by almost 20%. And those small dense particles, mm -hmm. well, what they did is they became large buoyant LDL particles. So it's really important also to note that there's no medication that can do this. It's pretty awesome. This <laughs> is just by changing what you're eating can drastically improve something that is a big cardiovascular risk for this patient population. But one of the other important things that we get questions about all the time is, I know that my diabetes may be reversed and all these other improvements may occur, but what's gonna happen to my LDL cholesterol? Well, again, we looked at this very specific question in our one-year cardiovascular risk outcomes uh, paper. And what happened? Well, LDL-C or LDL cholesterol did increase slightly. However, and this is really important, when we look at cardiovascular risk factors in a insulin resistant patient population, what becomes a much better marker of risk when it comes to LDL is LDL particle number. So how many LDL particles are there? Another term for this is the ApoB. This is really looking at how many particles there are that potentially could cause problems with heart disease. And what we saw is that these were unchanged through the year. And that is really important. So the question that we get asked all the time, I mean, the really root question is, I can make all these other things better, like my diabetes, like my liver function numbers, but am I making some of my cholesterol worse? And the answer from the, page, the paper is no. Again, the LDLP or ApoB 
did not change over the year. So that is a really important take home point from the study. So that's specifically looking at cholesterol. So what we see is dramatic improvements in atherogenic dyslipidemia, no change in those really important LDLP or ApoB numbers, and we see a really big improvement in blood pressure, a key risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And here's the important point. Not only did we get to see patients' blood pressure significantly decrease, but they were taking less medication for it. So we were making it better while being able to remove medication. So again, a critical risk factor. The other one that is really important to make note of is inflammation, because it is important for everyone to understand that at every phase of the development of cardiovascular disease, inflammation plays a key role. So what happens to the inflammatory markers with any intervention is really important. And the best one to look at specifically cardiovascular risk is one called C-reactive protein. And Catherine, in this study, our patients decreased their C-reactive protein by 40%. Wow. So again, another really important cardiovascular risk factor made better by the Verda treatment. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Hallberg. So our next question, can you point to any clinical evidence of the ketogenic diet's um, anti-inflammatory benefits? Yes. Yeah, so let's go back to what I was just talking about before, that C-reactive protein and the dramatic decrease. <laughs> We know that that improves, is an improvement in a cardiovascular risk factor. But again, that's an improvement in systemic inflammation overall. And we actually have this number supported by a decrease in our study in patients' white blood cell counts. Because that actually, I mean, people think of white blood cells and they think of elevation in sickness. But the other thing is there can be an elevation in chronic inflammation as well. So not only did we see the C-reactive protein decreasing by 40%, but we saw our patient's white blood cell count drop as well. For our next question, if I'm following a low-carb diet and I start eating carbs again, does that make the fat I've been eating have a negative impact on my cholesterol and heart? Okay, so what we're talking about really there is uh, the question is geared towards the past fat that someone has consumed when they're eating a low carb diet. And the answer to that is no, that's not gonna negatively impact their cardiovascular disease risk. But what they're talking about doing then is going back to our standard American diet, mm -hmm. right? Eating fat and eating carbohydrates. And what we have plenty of evidence for is that that combination is a problem. So I would really reframe this and say, okay, um, I was eating low carb and high fat and I was doing better. Maybe now I wanna add a little bit more carbs into my diet again, but we have to really be cautious about ensuring that those carbs that are added are not exceeding any individual's carbohydrate tolerance. Because if you increase carbs over your carbohydrate tolerance and add fat in, what you've done is gone right back to the standard American diet that has failed us for decades. I think that's a really great point, Dr. Hallberg, because it talks about, or it speaks to a little bit how we really try to personalize the Verda treatment to each patient's personal carbohydrate tolerance level. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, if you're just joining us, we want to welcome you to a Verda Facebook Live Q&A with Dr. Sarah Hallberg. Um, please put your questions in the comments below the video, and to get notified of future Facebook Lives and events, follow Verda on Facebook. So with that, our next question, can you provide any clinical evidence that the ketogenic diet is helpful in preventing cancer? So there are a lot of trials ongoing here as a potential adjunct cancer treatment. So by adjunct, I mean in addition to traditional cancer treatment. So it, in order to answer that question and as a prevention for cancer, there would have to be a really long 
um, what we call a hard outcomes trial. And I think that honestly we're probably pretty far away from that, but we're not that far away of finding out how a ketogenic diet may play a role in cancer treatment. Because as I said right now, over the next few years, we're expecting many of the ongoing trials in this very area to get published and really help with some insights into this question. For our next question, what are the possible side effects of coming off of insulin when your body does not produce enough C-peptide? Well, let's go back and first talk about C-peptide and exactly what is C-peptide. Because many patients who are getting the Verda treatment may have their C-peptide levels checked. And why do we do that? We do that because it gives us a really good idea of how much insulin their pancreas is able to produce. So when a patient is first, early, diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, on average, 50% of the cells in their pancreas that produce insulin have actually died already at the very beginning of the diagnosis because they've been overused for so long. They essentially tucker out. And so people would initially think, okay, look, if I wanna take a look at insulin levels um, and how much insulin my pancreas is able to produce, we'll just draw a insulin level. And that actually is really problematic um, in giving us an answer to the question of how much insulin is my body able to produce because our insulin levels are very dynamic through the day. They're up and down and up and down. So if you're just checking an insulin level, you're not really sure if you're catching a high one or a low one. But, and they're also metabolized differently. So insulin is metabolized in the liver very quickly. But insulin is released along with something called C-peptide. And it doesn't have these peaks, troughs, and quick metabolism um, issues that come with insulin. So when we're looking at someone's insulin producing ability, what we usually check is a C-peptide. It tells us how much insulin they're able to produce. So now that we understand C-peptide a little bit more, let's go back to that question and say, how is that going to influence my ability to get off insulin? Well, if your C-peptide is zero, meaning your body is not able to produce any insulin any longer, you will not be able to get off of insulin completely. That is a term called, or that is a condition called insulinopenia. And it's very similar to type one diabetes where patients aren't producing any insulin. It's just that the cause is different. In type one diabetes, this is an autoimmune process. And in type two diabetes, where someone develops uh, low or zero C-peptide, meaning they can't produce insulin any longer, it's essentially from pancreas burnout. Now, people who follow a strict low-carb diet who are still producing some insulin, meaning they have maybe a lower but still present C-peptide, possibly still have the ability to get off insulin or maybe all but a very small basal insulin. Again, and that's something that will be very personalized and needs the assistance of a physician. And that is one of the reasons why we have a physician, a Verda physician assigned to each patient in the Verda treatment so that we can help patients not only remove medication safely, because that is critical, but also at the beginning, take a look in patients who are taking insulin at the C-peptide to give them some realistic expectations about what can be accomplished and poten potentially at what rate. So this is a really important question because C-peptide for anyone who has type 2 diabetes over a long period of time and has needed exogenous or insulin that's in injected, a C-peptide can be really helpful in predicting how they will be able to get off insulin or if. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So our next question, how often is it okay to eat keto approved fruits and foods containing erythritol or other sugar alcohols? Um, would you say daily or less than daily? 
I would say that it really depends on each individual. And I know that that can sometimes be a frustrating answer, right? Meaning there's not one simple answer for this. But you know, the fact of the matter is we are all different. different. And what one person can do does not mean another person is able to do and have the same effect. So this is one of the areas where a Verta Health Coach comes in as a critical piece of the puzzle because your Verta Health Coach can help work with you to develop your own carbohydrate tolerance level and also that can lead over to sweeteners as well. Because some people, it seems that sweeteners can stall weight loss some. And in other people, it seems like they can have quite a bit of sweeteners and not ever have an issue at all. And so it's something that we need to experiment with. And you need to have someone to work with you and support you through trying to figure out what your tolerance is. What we can find is that most people, most people can consume at least on occasion sweeteners. Other people though, the answer may be that they can have them every day. So again, individualized, personalized, it's such an important key part of keeping people in good metabolic health and making the lifestyle changes to do this sustainable. And one of the pieces that Dr. Halberg mentioned is, you know, the um, sugar alcohols or erythritol or other sweeteners could stall weight loss. So we would be looking at, you know, how often are, are is one including these foods and how does that impact their other metrics like blood glucose and ketones as well? Absolutely. Thanks for saying that. That's a really important point. So the next question comes um, from, from an, an individual. So they say, I've been following a keto eating plan, but my weight loss has slowed even though I have more to lose. I struggle with increasing my calories and I still believe it's necessary to keep calories in the low end um, between 1,200 and 1,500 calories daily. Would increasing my daily calorie goals speed up my weight loss? Um, increasing daily calorie goals, no, probably not. Um, I would say the most important thing is to make sure that you're not hungry because that's mm -hmm. that sustainability piece that is key. And if you're not hungry, pushing yourself to eat um, beyond that would not be a good plan for the long run. So a couple of things that I would say to that. Number one, a weight stall for a while is very normal. So first you have to say, is this truly a plateau or is this just my body's pause period for a little bit? Um, and it, bodies seem to adjust to a lower weight. Um, so we see this in most everyone. So my first recommendation is to be patient on this. Um, and it may take a while for your body to essentially reset. So a pause in the weight loss sometimes can be very normal. And if you're not regaining weight, I like to tell people, think about this. What you're doing right now is you're practicing maintenance. And it can be very hard in the long term for people to maintain the weight that they've lost, even more so than to get down to a specific weight. So practicing maintenance is something that is a really important part of the process for everyone. Now, if your stall in weight loss continues on, one of the other things I would do is to go and spend a week really specifically weighing and calculating everything. Because, and you know, I'm guilty of this too, all of us here at Verda who follow the Verda treatment sometimes can fall into these traps where we say, oh, that looks like a cup of tomatoes. And even people who have been doing this for a long time, I encourage everyone to pause at least every couple of months and spend just a few days literally weighing and counting everything to make sure some things haven't snuck back in. And the other thing that I would say is, has exercise changed? Have you started exercise or have you stopped exercise? Because sometimes that can impact it. Believe it or not, especially in women, what we see often is when they begin exercise, which why wouldn't they? They're feeling better, they've lost that initial weight, they're ready to start moving. What happens is that can actually cause a prolonged weight plateau. 
Now, that initially sounds like it could be a problem, but in reality, what's happening is they tend to be building muscle. And so their body composition is changing, but they're just not seeing it on the scale. So believe me, if that's occurring, continue on and embrace that longer plateau and start to pay attention to things like, wait a minute, my pants fit a little bit differently. And you may get cues here that you're doing just fine from things other than the scale. I think those are some excellent tips for getting through that weight plateau and, and thinking about the perspective from that. Um, if you're just joining us, uh, welcome to our Facebook Live Q&A with Dr. Sarah Hallberg. If you have any questions, please just add them in the comments below the video and we'll get to them um, throughout the hour. And to get notified of future Facebook Lives um, and other Verda events, please follow Verda on Facebook. Can a ketogenic diet help fight um, uh, yeast infections? There is not any data on that. We do not have any clinical trials on this. Um, you know, yeast infections um, usually are caused by, they can be in um, warmth, so warm places in the body. You know, people can get them anywhere from underneath their breasts mm -hmm. to underneath panis to vaginally. Um, and again, sugar does feed yeast infections. So. I think that the basic science is there, that this may truly be a help, but we cannot promote that because we just don't have rigorous clinical trial evidence for this. So I would say is try it if you're battling yeast infections and see if this is something that helps. For our next question, how concerned should I be about high LDL-P numbers if my HDL numbers are in a normal range while I'm in nutritional ketosis? So LDL-P is, again, going back to what we talked about a little while ago, a much better assessment of cardiovascular risk than LDL-C. And so if someone has got really great improvements, decreasing triglycerides, increasing good cholesterol, but struggle with an elevated LDLP, what do they do? And this is not a solidly certain answer yet. We don't, we, we, there has been no evidence one way or the other 100%. So this is one of those places that you really need to work with your physician on. So again, it, the Verda physicians may ask other questions. What are other risk factors that you may have and how are those controlled? Or this is another place where we may say, let's go ahead and get something called a coronary calcium score to assess is there really any burden of cardiovascular disease already present. But once again, this is an individual call and this needs to be worked out one-on-one -on -one between patients and their physicians. And Verda physicians are all very, very expert in this area to be able to ensure that they are doing whatever we need to do to promote cardiovascular risk factor reduction for each and every patient individually. So would you fair to, or would you say it's fair that um, that it's not just one number that's that's driving you know that you're in bad health or, or great health? It's really a Absolutely. big picture of everything. It is, Catherine. There's not one biomarker when it comes to cardiovascular health that we can point to and say if this is good or if this is bad, you're in the clear or you're doomed. It's not like that. You know, what we have is we have a whole bunch of things that we know are associated with increased cardiovascular risks, and we have to look at the larger picture. You can't get lost in the forest <laughs> for the trees. So each one of those and taking a look at the whole in each individual patient is really important, and that takes personalization. Mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent reminder because it's very easy to get caught up on that one number. Mm -hmm. Would you say there are any specific drawbacks or benefits to following a ketogenic diet for postmenopausal women? Um, so I would say there's a lot of advantages to following a ketogenic diet for postmenopausal women. And you know what we know um, is that postmenopausal women do tend to struggle more with their weight, and it tends to be central weight. Um, and so again, a ketogenic diet can improve things for postmenopausal women just as it can for 
premenopausal women um, and men of all ages. So if someone is struggling with those postmenopausal weight gain, especially in those specific areas, mm -hmm. I would really encourage people to consider a ketogenic diet. And as far as drawbacks goes, no, there's no specific drawbacks there. I mean, this is a great patient population for this to be implemented with. What could be the cause of a strong heartbeat when someone's in ketosis? Are there any suggestions of supplements that might help with that? A strong heartbeat. So I, I would presume that that just means something that one can feel more. Um, that it's not necessarily a racing heartbeat or a feeling of a skipped heartbeat. So if I'm taking that question literally, that it's just something you can feel more. Here is the likely cause someone has lost weight and literally they can feel it easier. So when people lose weight and there actually is truly less there, right, um, they can be more sensitive to feeling their heartbeat. So a strong heartbeat per se is probably not a problem, maybe a sign of your <laughs> success. Now, if that goes into a racing heartbeat, a skipped heartbeat, again, that's something that I would see their physician for. Thank you. Um, if you're just joining us, we have um, Dr. Sarah Hallberg here for our live Facebook uh, Q&A. Uh, please put your questions in the comments below the video and we'll address those throughout the hour today. And to get notified of future Facebook Lives and, and Verda events, follow Verda on Facebook. So jumping to our next question, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any plans or timelines on publishing the two-year results of the Verda Health clinical trial? Ooh, that is a great <laughs> question and I'm super excited to answer that because, well, let me say something before I answer it, which is we have just had an amazing group of truly pioneering patients who have participated in our large clinical trial. I mean, we all, all of us, not just at Verda, but People around the country should really pause for a moment and let's just tip our hats to this group of people who have participated in this trial that I really think is going to be part of a nationwide change. So if any of our clinical trial patients are watching, you know, a big thumbs up to you, true pioneers. And we are just wrapping up now the two year um, results. So we're having the, by the end of this month, we will have gathered all of our data for two years. And so it just becomes actually analyzing that data and writing the paper. And that seems like, okay, we could do that in a couple of weeks, but let me tell you, it's a process because there is a lot of statistical analysis that needs to take place and a lot of writing and rewriting. And it actually takes a really long time to get a paper published. Um, because they go through a peer review process. So what is a realistic timeline? Well, we are very hopeful that this paper can get out before the end of 2018, but don't hold me <laughs> to a promise on that because again, it's dependent on many variables there that all have to fall into line. But we are really excited to get those results out. So we're gonna be doing everything we can to keep that process moving forward. I actually can't wait for that day. <laughs> I think it's going to be fantastic and I am really excited to share with the world again what's possible when it comes to treating this epidemic. This next question is a very common question I get from patients. How should I approach fat bombs? Um, are they a snack or are they in addition to a meal? So again, I'm going to go back to that frustrating answer first, which is it depends. It can be very individual. And so for some people, it's a great snack. For other people, they can have it as part of a sweet treat right at the end of the meal, but you have to be really cautious. And remember this, fat is fantastic. We know that we need to have a larger percentage of fat in our diet, but fat is not a free food. So just because something is containing even exclusively fat does not mean more is better. So we have to police things even like a fat bomb. So I'd say work with your health coach on this to find out what's going to be the right amount or cadence, like 
every day? Do I do this every other day? Is this a once a week treat for me? Depending on how your body is reacting. And then really, you know, how is it best for you? Is it one fat bomb in the afternoon and I'm great until I can get home and have time to prepare dinner? Because for some people that may be the perfect place to put a fat bomb. For other people, they're done with dinner but they just want that small bite of something sweet and they make a small fat bomb. For that person, that may also be perfect too. So again, individualized on this, but remember, Fat is not a free food. I think that's an important point as well because it's very easy to overdo those fat bombs and then while you may have amazing ketones, your weight is probably going to stall as well so they can definitely go a little too far if you're, if you're not careful. So that personalization piece is very important. It Thanks is. for those tips, Dr. Halberg. Absolutely. I've had people tell me uh, that this can't be healthy long term. I'm sure you you hear this all the time. And the artificial sweeteners are what's causing diabetes in the first place. What would, you, what would your elevator pitch be to answer these critics? Okay, so um, let's go back to the sweetener part first and then let's talk about the long-term aspect of this. I wanna make, we've got two questions here and I think they're both excellent questions and I wanna make sure that we um, treat each of them individually. So my feelings about sweeteners are honestly, we don't know how much sweetener or the very long impact of sweeteners. So I take this in, th this is my view on sweeteners. We want to be able to use them as little as possible and we use them really as a tool to make this intervention sustainable. Because, you know, when it comes to sugar, Sugar for anyone with diabetes is going to lead to long-term problems. And so we want to be able to keep people away from utilizing sugar to make foods palatable. But to tell someone who really enjoys sweets that, well, this lifestyle intervention, you can never have anything sweet for the rest of your life, I mean, that, that's not going very far, okay? But I'll say a couple of things, which is number one, if when people are early on beginning the intervention and they spend even a few weeks early on without eating anything sweet, you know, maybe even staying away from those sweeteners for a short period of time at the beginning, their taste for sweet things will change. And you know, you have to try it to truly believe that because I get that comment from people all the time. I can't believe I couldn't eat X, Y, or Z any longer because the sweetness was overwhelming to me. So right there, that's gonna enable you to be able to decrease any sweetener use significantly. And then I just say, use sweetener sparingly to make things sustainable, okay? The long-term answers to sweeteners, we don't know, but we have pretty good evidence that processed carbohydrates, including sugar, and their impact on metabolic health for patients with type 2 diabetes, prediabetes, or insulin resistance is negative. So we have to keep both of those things in mind. Now, long-term impact of this, what we know is that long-term impact of our typical dietary guideline uh, associated dietary recommendations has been a failure, has made people sicker. So we have great evidence on this in ketogenic diet in studies out to 56 weeks already. And again, with the improvements in metabolic health, including the huge risk factor for so many diseases, cardiovascular disease, cancer, that is type 2 diabetes. Long term, if we are able to reverse people out of that disease pattern, we can say with confidence that they're getting healthier. Are some artificial sweeteners better than others? Um, specifically, you know, what are the benefits or the effects of saccharin or glycerin or, or other artificial sweeteners like that? So artificial sweeteners, um, there are many different categories, if you will. There's sugar, alcohols, and then there's what we call the saccharin. These are the chemically created um, non-nutritive sweeteners. And so let's talk about sugar alcohols first. So sugar alcohols are end in a lol. You can always kind of pick them up on a food, food label. Uh, xylitol, erythritol, mannitol, sorbitol. 
Those are all examples of sugar alcohols, and they can all actually impact blood sugar a little bit differently. And so it's important if you're trying out a new sugar alcohol that you check your blood sugar to see what the reaction is for you. But the ones that tend to have the least impact by far on blood sugar, which is key here, are going to be xylitol and potentially erythritol. Now with sugar alcohols, especially in higher doses, people can tend to have some GI issues. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind as well. So experiment with them when it comes to your blood sugar and your individual tolerance of them. But we tend to recommend a lot of the sugar alcohols overall because of that. And actually, I mean, xylitol, let's take a quick look at xylitol uh, itself. And that is one of the interesting things that people don't realize is right now, everybody who's watching this, Catherine and I, we're making xylitol right now. Our bodies make xylitol. So again, what we're doing is we're ingesting something that we're also making. And so that's one of the reasons that we recommend that. Our bodies are used to that. Xylitol is found in erythritol to um, a lesser degree naturally in fruits and even vegetables. So again, that's high on our recommendation list, but everybody needs to check out their individual tolerance of them. Now, the non-nutritive sweeteners, those are ones that have no calories, and they don't by themselves have an impact on blood sugar. And that's been shown in multiple studies. So let's take a look at Splenda, for example. Splenda doesn't, uh, over uh, a patient population, increase blood sugar. Once again, I'll always say, check your own individual blood sugar, but it tends to not have an impact. That being said, it's a chemically created compound. So if you're using something like Splenda, I would use it sparingly. And what you'll notice with these non-nutritive sweeteners is that in their liquid form, it'll say no carbohydrates, no calories. But when you get them in their powdered form, that's a different story. Why? Because they've had to add something called bulking agents, which are carbohydrates, to make them powdery so that you can use them, for example, in baking recipes. So there's a big difference between the liquid forms of these and the powdered forms. And one other sweetener that I'd like to draw attention to um, that is a non-nutritive sweetener but is a little bit different is stevia. So stevia is just from a stevia plant. In other words, it's not chemically created. Now that being said, stevia is available under many different names. And some of these, the stevia leaves are highly processed and some aren't. So a good idea is if you're choosing stevia, you want to take a look and research what brand that you're buying so that you can get the least processed stevia. Or if you want to be completely natural about it, grow some stevia. Now stevia grown and utilized straight from the plant can have a little bit of licorice uh, taste to it. Some people really enjoy it and for some people it makes it a little less tolerable. So those are my comments about sweeteners. Sugar alcohols, we put them into non-nutritive sweeteners, but the non-nutritive sweeteners are different in a liquid form than they are in a powdered form. And always, when introducing any kind of sweetener, check your blood sugar. If you're just joining us, welcome to our Facebook Live with Dr. Sarah Hallberg. Um, please put any questions that you have in the comments below the video and we'll address those um, during our, our last 20 minutes or so. And to get notified of future Facebook Live events um, and other Verda events, make sure to follow Verda on Facebook. All right, here's a really good one. Yes. And I think the answer is going to be it depends, but <laughs> maybe you can shed a little more light for us. Is how do you know what your personal carbohydrate tolerance level is? So that's a great question. And it depends. No, no, but let's, let's answer that with a little bit more detail here, okay? So what I like to say is that people can develop different metabolic flexibilities, okay? So let's just take someone who does not have type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes, never had an issue with blood sugar, no family history of it, 
um, they obviously have a higher carbohydrate tolerance. And now that may not last forever because if they utilize that high carbohydrate and eat lots of sugar and refined carbohydrates, they very well may develop a lower carbohydrate tolerance or insulin resistance. But that is at one, one end of the spectrum of carbohydrate tolerance. At the other end of the spectrum carbo of carbohydrate tolerance when it comes to type 2 diabetes is someone who has had very long-standing diabetes and as we talked about earlier, has overworked their beta cells in their pancreas and truly is unable to produce enough insulin. Those people are at the other extreme end of carbohydrate tolerance. So there's a big spectrum here, okay? And where, most people fall in the middle of the spectrum, and where exactly in the middle do you fall? And the first thing I'll say is that may change, okay? So in other words, we may find someone who's at the lower end of carbohydrate tolerance, and as they Im implement a Verta treatment, they improve their insulin resistance, which is very nicely documented in our one-year clinical trial. Insulin resistance scores drop dramatically. They may actually shift themselves to having a higher carbohydrate tolerance. Now, I'll tell you right now, Anyone who improves their insulin resistance, if they go back to eating a high carbohydrate tolerance, they will develop problems again. Okay, so this is helping back people out, but it's not curing them. And that's a really important point to make. If we implement the Verta treatment, someone does it just for a while, goes back to a high carbohydrate lifestyle, they will have recurrent problems at some point. So important to remember that as we think about that sustainability piece. But in figuring out exactly where in the carbohydrate tolerance spectrum you are at any given time, keeping in mind that that could change, it's really going to be following your blood sugar. And if you have a Verta Health Coach, they're going to be key in helping you with that because they're going to be watching your blood sugar. And say you try a new food, what's your body's reaction to it? Are you doing really good and your blood sugars have been in the 90s and then all of a sudden you went out to a new restaurant and had a sauce on, on something uh, on your dinner plate that night and all of a sudden the next morning your blood sugar was 180? Whoa! That was over your carbohydrate tolerance. And even though maybe the food choices looked good, it was probably something in the sauce that you weren't aware was put in there. And most of the time, unfortunately, that winds up being sugar. So it's just going to be following those blood sugars. And you know, I'd like to take an opportunity with this question to point out something that I think is going to be key in the type 2 diabetes community, and that's going to be the advent of continuous glucose monitors that are now available to the type 2 diabetes population. So continuous glucose monitoring is exactly that, what it sounds like. It's monitoring your blood sugar, not when you prick your finger and you check it one, two, even more like four or six times a day, which is helpful, but we've got big parts of the day, including overnight, where we're not sure what's happening with your blood sugar. We're just checking it at specific points in time during the day. And continuous glucose monitors have been available, but they have been so expensive that they've really only been implemented for type one diabetes. But now there's a new continuous glucose monitor available called the Libre, and these are very inexpensive. And I've been utilizing them in some of our patients who have found them to be incredibly helpful at just this, determining their carbohydrate tolerance because they can watch the line through the day instead of just points on that line to see exactly how they're reacting to certain food. So I think finding everyone's individual carbohydrate tolerance is very important. Working with your Verda health coach and following your blood sugars when you eat anything new is going to be a wonderful way to make sure that you are personalizing your carbohydrate tolerance threshold for where you're at right now. Great answer to a great question. Mm -hmm. What amount of dairy or lactose is allowed on a ketogenic diet? Well, for most people, that is a great source of additional fat and often protein. 
okay? Sometimes we will have patients who have issues with dairy. It may be the lactose in it. Um, it may be other aspects of the specific proteins in dairy. And so it's one of those things. If people are really struggling, if they're having some sort of side effect, which oftentimes is GI, they can try removing dairy for a few days to see if that could be the issue. Um, but I would say that's the exception for most patients instead of the rule. Uh, so for most patients, the answer to how much dairy can you have in a day is how much is it taking to get you full, mm -hmm. as long as you're making sure that you're meeting your protein requirements for the day. For our next question, what are your thoughts about upping your carbs to 50 to 100 grams um, a day after achieving type 2 diabetes reversal or, or your goal weight? So it all depends on what your individual carbohydrate tolerance is, right? Nice follow-up yes. question there. <laughs> yes, it's a perfect, thank you very much for this question. So again, let's go back to that spectrum idea, right? So someone started out at the very carbohydrate intolerant end of the spectrum and they've done a great job with this and they've worked their way up. They very well may be at that 50 to 100 range. That's totally possible. Um, for other people, they're not. They're going to fall maybe at the very low end of that, and they can do 50, but if they go above that, um, they're going to run into issues. So you're going to have to just check your blood sugar, but that is not like a, you know, unfathomable range for some people. Some people can regain what we like to call metabolic flexibility, where they can tolerate a higher carbohydrates, potentially even in the 50 to 100 range. But the other important thing is, if you are one of those people who can get into that 50 or 100 range, you always want to be asking about the quality of the carbohydrates that you're adding in. Because if you were at 30 and doing great, and then you moved up to 50 and you're still doing good and we're gonna experiment with going higher, if you're adding those in with refined flours, I mean, you're gonna get into trouble quickly. If you're choosing to add more carbohydrates by choosing berry fruit or choosing to eat more nuts, those are gonna be foods that are gonna allow you, again, more flexibility. So be cautious not only of what your specific gram number is, but exactly what are the foods that you're choosing to increase the carbohydrates if you're able in your diet. Do you have any evidence of neuropathy improving with diabetes reversal? Well, we see this anecdotally often in the mm -hmm. clinic and patients will report an improvement, but can I claim that this is absolutely a treatment for this? No, because once again, we don't have rigorous data on this. So it's one of those other situations where I say, look, this is probably good for a lot of things in each individual case that we have good data on. Try it out and if the neuropathy is improving for you, Wonderful, you don't have to wait for the rigorous clinical data, but to be able to say to the masses, you should do this for that specific treatment, we have to wait for the data. It's really important to say that we as a company, the Verta treatment is being driven by data. So we are continuously getting more data, but what we are doing, we are only gonna be promoting things that we know are truly evidence-based. And like I said, there may be plenty of good evidence-based reasons to try the Verta treatment, and for some people, that may also improve their neuropathy, which is fantastic. If you're just joining us, welcome to our Facebook Live with Dr. Sarah Hallberg. Uh, please put your questions in the comments below the video, and we'll, get to, we'll try to get to as many of those as we can today. And to get notified of future Facebook events and other Verda events, make sure to follow Verda on Facebook. And we have just about 10 minutes left, so we'll try to get to as many questions as we can, because I know there are a lot of good ones out there. All right, here's a, another common one that, that I get from a lot of patients. So I've noticed I'm losing hair on keto. Is this normal, and what can I do about it? Um, so it can be, and it's very important to say what we should really turn this into because what is much more true is I'm losing weight with rapid weight, or excuse me, I'm losing hair with rapid weight loss because it probably has nothing to do with the diet itself. It's the fact that the diet is causing weight loss. And we do get this question a lot, and here's how I like to explain it to my patients in a way that they can really understand. And that is when women have babies, they don't go home from the hospital with hair loss, right? 
But what they will find is that when that baby is four, maybe six months old, all of a sudden they're starting to lose hair. And that's because giving birth is a big shock to the system, right? I mean, it's obviously a good one. We all, we love it, but it is a big shock to the system. Weight loss is the same way. It's a big shock to the system. We love it, we wanna have it, but again, weight loss is likely to occur four to six months after the beginning of a period of rapid weight loss. And that's because the hair grows in phases. So what I tell patients here is be patient. Let the phase pass and then the hair will come back. If people are really worried about it, I'll say, start taking some B-complex vitamins. I mean, I don't think there's gonna be any problem with patients doing that. Um, whether or not that's gonna help, it might. Um, but the bigger thing is you just gotta give it time and let that phase pass. Next question. Uh, what are the or what effect can a well formulated ketogenic diet have on osteoporosis? So I'm gonna say table the answer to this question because we have data on this that we have not analyzed, but we will and intend on publishing, looking at DEXA scans um, in our patients in our large clinical trial. So right now, the evidence on this is scant to non-existent, essentially. And so we have a, uh, the ability to analyze some data right now and put these results out. So I'm gonna have to say, hold on this, because I wanna share, uh, wanna again, ensure that all my answers are evidence-based answers, and we will have the answer to this soon. What does the research tell us about ketogenic diets for thin people with type 2 diabetes? Specifically, would a ketogenic diet be a good option for diabetes reversal for people of Southeast Asian descent? Um, so the answer to that is yes. And so patients of Southeast Asian descent do tend to develop diabetes at a much lower weight than in many other uh, parts of the world. And so they may not have 100 pounds to lose, but it doesn't mean that changing the content of the diet won't lead to successful diabetes reversal just as it would with any other patient population. So I would really encourage people of South Asian descent to consider this as a treatment for type 2 diabetes, really important. Is a ketogenic diet an option for a patient with a family history of hypercholesteremia? Um, absolutely, and like I said, again, let's go back to the cardiovascular risk paper that we just published, looking at improvement in 22 out of 26 risk factors. And so having a family history of hypercholesterolemia does not preclude anyone from participating in a lifestyle change that includes nutritional ketosis. But once again, I'm gonna go back to say, everyone is different. And this is one of those things that you need to have a physician who is following with you um, to help make sure that you're able to make personalized uh, choices and treatment plans as you move forward. We at Verda want everyone to have their cardiovascular risks as reduced in all aspects as possible. How often, if at all, would you repeat a CAC? And can you tell us what a CAC is? Yes, CAC is, for, is a coronary calcium score. And so coronary calcium scores are a really great way to help people make decisions, giving them another point, essentially. Remember, we don't wanna miss the forest for the trees. And sometimes that can happen um, when it comes to cardiovascular risk reduction. We wanna be able to have as many data points as we can. And somebody's coronary calcium score can be a very helpful point here. So in other words, if someone's had high cholesterol all their life, um, they go on a um, lifestyle intervention like the Diverta treatment and their cholesterol stays elevated um, instead of going down like it does with many of our patients or potentially even goes up and they have a coronary calcium score of zero, that's a really different place 
than someone who has had a lifetime of high cholesterol and has a very, very high coronary calcium score. So a coronary calcium score is a CT scan. People go in, they can usually be had um, for very low prices. I know in our area, um, Indiana University Health offers them for $49. It's a very quick test in, out, and what it, the CT is looking for is calcium. Calcium in the arteries that supply the heart with blood. And so what a coronary calcium score should be is zero. In other words, no evidence of heart disease that has developed into coronary plaque or calcium. Now, anyone who has a positive coronary calcium score, even if it's low positive, um, using and checking this over time, one of the big things that's going to be a factor there is statin medication use. Because anyone with high cholesterol who then has a positive coronary calcium score if they get started on a statin, their coronary calcium score actually has the potential to increase. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a bad thing because calcium in that plaque shows us that it's stable. And I'm gonna go here and digress just a little bit into coronary artery disease uh, physiology. Many people think of a heart attack as a clogged tube, right? So you develop disease in your arteries and they get smaller and smaller in diameter until one day they close. And that's actually not what happens with heart attacks and coronary artery disease progression to an actual event. What happens is there's a degree of disease in an artery, and for whatever reason, there becomes a piece of this plaque that's unstable. It gets kicked off, floats downstream, blocks the flow of blood, and that causes the heart disease, or, or excuse me, the heart attack. So what we wanna do if someone has any degree of disease is we wanna stabilize it. And when we stabilize it, that can actually be seen as an increase in the coronary artery calcium score. Um, but that can mean, some, in many people, stabilization of disease. So that's really important. Mm -hmm. But I love the coronary artery calcium score in people as, again, an additional data point. Um, and we can have a really good discussion together at what that person's individual risk factors mm -hmm. are and what is our next logical step. And it's a decision that should always be a shared decision. <laughs> I think this is so important. I will never say, here's a prescription, you need to take it. Because taking a new prescription, I mean, let's, that's a really big decision to be made. And it should be made as a team. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be one person dictating what another person does. It should be to say, let's put, your, let's put all the ducks on the table, if you will. <laughs> let's talk about your risk factor and let's come up together with what our treatment path is going forward. Do you need to be in ketosis for the low carb, high fat diet to be effective? Or can eating keto-ish be acceptable or successful? Well, that's a great question, and honestly, the jury is out. I think that what we know about ketones are they can be incredibly important in helping people know that they're doing it right, right? Because if they have ketones, what does that mean? It means that they're using fat for energy and they're, they've got it. They're implementing the lifestyle intervention well. If they're doing keto-ish and they don't have that to judge, I mean, it's really a little bit more difficult to say, how am I doing today? Mm -hmm. Was this food choice a good one for me or did I just make a choice that's you know negative on my metabolic health? So I think they can be really important there. And we're just beginning to understand the benefits of ketones. So I think more and more data is coming out on this and I would not be surprised within the next few years if we really get a much more firm stance saying ketones are critical mm -hmm. in health. There have been studies recently that came out that show ketones very specifically decrease inflammation. Once again, going back to remind everyone, key component of all stages of cardiovascular disease formation, inflammation. Some really nice studies showing that ketosis specifically 
those elevated ketone levels lead to a uh, decrease in inflammation. In the other one, there was even uh, longevity studies that came out, and yes, it was a mouse study, but I think it really opens mm -hmm. up questions. I mean, where is the possibility for ketones to play in so many aspects of disease? And we mentioned it briefly before, Right now, they're ongoing a lot of trials with ketones specifically in cancer and in many neurologic diseases. For over 100 years, in fact, ketogenic diets, very specifically needing those ketones mm -hmm. present, treats epilepsy. So I think that we're going to find out much more on exactly what else besides <laughs> metabolic health improvements we may get as a benefit by following a true ketogenic diet um, and implementing that as a lifestyle. So stay tuned, more info to come on ketones over, yes, over the next absolutely, couple of years. <laughs> absolutely. So we have time for just a couple more questions. So with that, we'll go to the next one. So is it dangerous for someone that's living with type 2 diabetes to do ketogenic diet without measuring all of those biomarkers and, and just following the basic rules? Um, it can be. That's, that's the really quick down and dirty answer. It can be. It can be very dangerous if you are not working with a physician. Why? Because medications that patients take for diabetes are intended to lower their glucose. And if you're making lifestyle interventions aimed at lowering your glucose, you can enter into a potentially really dangerous double whammy. That's why everyone entering into the Verta treatment plan not only gets their health coach who can help personalize their food choices, but they also have their own Verta physician who is ensuring that they are adjusting those medications appropriately safely, but also getting them down so that people can successfully reverse their diabetes and get rid of some of their medications. So it is so important to have a partner in a physician who's working with you on this. And I can't stress that enough because if we get those blood sugars to drop too quickly because no one is helping with medication adjustment, that can be incredibly dangerous. So thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, to get more information, follow Verta Health on Facebook and check out our research, uh, much of which Dr. Hallberg referenced today at vertahealth.com slash research. So thanks Dr. Hallberg for joining us today. Um, I learned a lot, I hope everyone else learned a lot and we'll see you back here next time. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it and I'll be excited. We'll be doing um, more of these in the future.